Hello and welcome back to the video lecture for Introduction to GPS. Again, the intent of this video lecture is to provide you with a short lecture that highlights key concepts pertaining to GPS. So today we're going to look at the GPS signals. So when people start comparing different GPS devices or receivers, a feature commonly listed among the marketing materials is the number of channels a GPS has. So inside every GPS device is something known as a GPS chipset, which is the heart of finding where you are. Different chipsets use a different number of channels. So what are these channels? And are they important in determining which GPS to purchase? So at the most basic level, Think of your GPS as needing one channel for every satellite. It is the every satellite it is communicating with. So it needs one channel for every satellite to communicate with. Note that there's some exceptions to this, but for this discussion, we're not going, we're just going to ignore that. So the more channels your GPS chipset has, the more satellites it can communicate with at one time. So the more channels, the better, right? Well, no, not exactly. So at any given time, there are at least 24, more often 30 satellites that make up the GPS system. So many GPS receivers have a satellite information screen that will show you how many satellites your GPS is tracking at any given time. If you view this page and take your GPS device somewhere with an unobstructed sky view, you can see how many satellites your GPS is tracking and thus how many channels are being used. So take this image for an example, and you will see that the GPS is tracking nine satellites. Those ones denoted in green. There's another one there in gray that is showing in view, but it's not being used for positioning. So essentially nine channels were being used here. So it is rare for a GPS to track more than 12 satellites at any given time. So in that sense, having GPS with more than 12 channels might seem like a waste, and to some degree it is. Can channels be used for more than just tracking a satellite right now? Sometimes channels can be reserved for searching as new satellites are predicted to come into your view. If you are watching this satellite screen, over a period of an hour or so, you will see that some satellites disappear from your view while other satellites appear on the horizon. So while your GPS might be tracking only eight satellites, it might be using a couple of other channels to search for new satellites it is predicting will come into view. So we have 20 or 30 or 60 channel receivers. To some degree, it's a marketing gimmick, but back in the old days of GPS, a receiver might only have eight channels. Then came along 12 channel receivers, which improved reception and acquisition times dramatic, dramatically. Then came along 16 channel receivers, which also showed some improvement. So where do we go from here? Add more channels? Unfortunately, now that the number of channels, has, channels a receiver has exceeds the amount of satellites you can realistically track at any given time. So the benefits of 20 plus channel receivers get a little muddier. So our Juno 3Bs have 12 channels and is transmitted on the L1 code, which we will talk about later. So satellite signals, civilian and military signals are not created equal. We have the course acquisition code versus the pre uh, precision code, P code. So the course acquisition code is freely available to the public and it's transmitted on the L1, L2C, L5C, and L1C frequencies. Generally, it's, we talk about the L1, the L2, and the L5. The precision code is designated for military use only, and it's encrypted to prevent unauthorized use, and it's transmitted on the L2 frequency. So a satellite signal takes about 0.06 seconds for a GPS radio signal to reach Earth if it's directly overhead, a little longer if it's off on the horizon. So satellites require a direct line or view to the GPS receiver. Signals cannot penetrate water, soil, walls, or other obstacles. So if you're out collecting information, GPS points, 
you know, being underneath trees, in buildings, under a bridge, in a close mountain range, or your hands over the receiver antenna, or your body can block all the satellite signals, is going to make the reception poor, if not impossible. Also, heavy forest canopy causes interference, making it difficult to collect positions. And in canyons, or these urban canyons in cities, GPS signals are blocked by mountains or buildings. So there are some limitations, and you have to be aware of those. Probably the most common for us is going to be um, being very close to a building or underneath trees, both of which are going to give you inaccurate positions. So each satellite sends a unique code called the pseudo-random code, which is extremely complex, hence it's almost random, so that patterns are not linked up at the wrong place on the code. So basically we want to make sure we know which satellite is transmitting a code and that the receiver is transmitting its own code. So each satellite has that unique pseudo-random code, and they are basically a sequence of on and off pulses as shown in this image here. So these are kind of ons, offs, ons, offs for three different satellites. So there are two types of pseudo-random codes as we just discussed. The course acquisition code, called the CA code, or the precise code, called the P code. So to measure the travel time of the satellite signal, you have to know when the signal left the satellite and when the signal reaches the receiver. So satellites generate this pseudo-random code sequence that actually repeats every millisecond. So the trick is that the GPS satellite and our receivers are synchronized so they generate the same exact code at the same time. So when a GPS receiver receives the code from the satellite, it looks back to see how long ago the receiver generated the same code. So the time difference is how long the signal took to get from the satellite to the receiver. So in this image, the green dotted lines represent the time difference from when the signal left the satellite and when the receiver received the GPS signal. So we can see it's generating the same code, and we can see by looking between the time differences where those two codes line up. So what now happens is here the receiver is sliding this code back to receive that it's received from the satellite to the left to match up with this code it generated. And you now notice the two codes on the red on the top and the red on the bottom now line up. The amount we have to shift back the receiver's version, the bottom red pseudo-random code, is equal to the travel time of the satellite's version. So we just multiply that time by the speed of light and bingo, we have our distance to the satellite. So basically what we're using is these codes coming from the satellite and the codes coming from the receiver. They're the same codes. We just have to look at where they match up and that will tell us how long it's taken us in terms of time for that signal to leave the satellite and to reach the receiver. So this is what we looked at in the previous video lecture determining how we did the time. So we knew that the, the uh, change in time was 0 0.065 seconds, meaning that's how long it took for the pseudo-random code to leave the satellite and be received by the receiver. We know this velocity, the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. We do that calculation, and now we know the distance from that satellite to the receiver is 12,108.36 miles. So with that kind of information, we can now start calculating where we are. And if we did that with four satellites, we would have our position on Earth. Have a great day, and see you in the next lecture in class.